<laughs> anyway, come, on, come, on come over here, Mark. We'll shoot the same thing. Yeah, yeah, we're rolling. Nice, yeah, we're rolling. Nice edge light. Yeah. Nice modeling light. We're here with director Wes Craven on Bring his. Bring that light in uh -oh. here. Bring it. On his new film, People Under the Stairs, where we just saw a horrifying scene. Horrifying. Horrifying. What was horrifying? Oh, well, we just helped. Well, it was horrifying. We were over schedule. We were over budget. And, and basically, basically, did all the special most of it ended up we're dummies. there. Pit of Death. Uh, I hit of Death was over there. Pit of Death. And you'll have to pay five, six bucks, maybe seven. Yeah. Yeah. By the time this comes out, 8.59. Which is also very scary. So there's a lot of scary things about this movie. Back in February of 1988, Bob Kurtzman, Greg Nicotero, and myself decided that we were going to not work for anybody else and form our own company. So it was a roll of the dice. I mean, to, it was dangerous. But we wanted to do it. We were tired of working for other people, not getting the recognition, not making any money. And, uh, and we, just, we just went ahead and did this. And it worked out really, really well. We started off doing very extremely low budget stuff, grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. At the time, people under the stairs came up. Uh, KMB was like, you know, we were do it. We were working for maybe three, four years at that point, point. Um, and we were kind of known for the guys, or like the young guys that were coming up in the business that were doing really good stuff on a budget. We were brought on board by a friend of mine named Stuart Besser. I'd done a movie that Dark Horse Comics had done called Doctor Giggles, and Stuart Besser was the line producer. So Stuart went from that movie to People Under the Stairs and brought a lot of the same people. And we got to be really good friends. So he said, hey, I'm doing this movie with Wes Craven. And he brought us on and, and uh, it was Wes and uh, another producer, Dixie Cap and, and Stuart. And, um, and we kind of hit it off, you know. And, and K&B was busy, but we still were small. And even though we had a lot of stuff going on, it, it still was all very manageable. You know, the storyline is, you know, there's these guys, Everett McGill and, and, his, and his wife, and they capture these kids and they put them in the basement. It was a fun project. The script was, it was weird. It's a very strange movie. What I like about it is you start watching it and you think it's one movie. You know, it's, like, it's a lot like Pulp Fiction uh, or From Dust Till Dawn where, you know, you watch a movie and you're like, oh, well, it's about these two people. And then, of course, uh, Ving Rhames' character is killed. Uh, at the beginning, and then it becomes about uh, Brandon's character. People Under the Stairs primarily was, um, we all three of us worked on it, Greg, Bob, and myself, but it was kind of Greg. Greg was the point guy on that show. And he brought in um, Earl Ellis and Mark Matry to uh, handle the artistic aspect for the most part. And they did all the sculpting and all that and ended up going to, going to set and doing a lot of, a lot of the application. And, and I think I went a couple nights and did stuff. We were tasked with creating the look of these characters. They were like these sort of pale yellowish green uh, makeups with black contact lenses. The idea that they've just been uh, devoid of any sun. They, they're only eating what scraps are thrown to them. We had to come up with these kind of feral kind of makeups on these guys with big black eyes. And you know, back then everybody was, you know, still had that kind of like, late 80s, early 90s hair, you know, kind of lost boys hair going on. And, and um, you know, the makeups were really nice. They were like forehead, nose, cheeks, chins, stuff like that, dentures. Somehow they really got messed up under the stairs for a really long time. But, uh, you know, I didn't, it's, it's interesting, an interesting concept. Yeah, I mean, that's what Wes wanted. He said, you know, yeah. th these people have not seen daylight for years and so they become uh, you know accustomed to darkness and they get pale skin they're malnourished they're not they don't, they don't have their vitamin supply you know so it's like yeah they're pale and and they had dark eyes because they just got so wide the idea was that their pupils were just so wide trying to take in the dark you know to see in the dark that it almost blacked out their eyes we had another character that sean whalen played called roach and roach was was like sort of highlight and shadow, kind of really pale with like kind of screwy fingernails and, and, and kind of creepy looking. We did this other thing too where we wanted one character to like have this weird mask that was stitched together with human skin like it was this sort of 
sensory deprivation kind of mask, you end up just getting little hints and little bits and pieces of them. And then we had, um, we had this big Ving Rhames body we did. There's one big scene where Ving Rhames character is killed and he's hung upside down and you see this brief yeah. moment where Everett is you know, like cutting the skin off of him. Ready? And action! <laughs> So we did a live cast of Ving and cast his full body and his head and we sculpted it as if it was hanging upside down. So all the weight, uh, the way the arms were hanging and it was a big deal. Like one of the first times we had done anything like that, which was like a full nude body that was cut up to be like sort of mutilated. And it was paint, you know, all the muscle and everything was, was added in later and then you see he cuts the chain and or he cuts the rope and it drops into that pit with all the uh, bones and things yeah, in it. He'll definitely come very close to camera okay, when it comes so down. Drop whenever you're ready. Okay, ready? Drop it. Oh man. That was crap. Yeah. Ving wasn't anybody at that point, you know, and, and he was apprehensive about the life cast, I remember, and Wes said, well, if you're not going to do the life cast, then I'll just recast the part, you know, because it's essential, and he's like, no, no, I'll do it, I'll do it. This one was kind of weird because he had his legs crossed over and his arms hanging back behind, you know, and he had to lay out on a table. I don't think he enjoyed it at all, but uh, we, you know, covered him in alginate and plaster bandage and popped that off and then created a clay sculpt of him that... Um, we then had to sculpt the backside on because he's laying on a flat table. Uh, he didn't have a butt on the backside. It was, that's also where we pour the clay through. So once it's in clay, we end up, you know, re-sculpting that whole thing and then molding that in fiberglass and that ended up using, that body has like been used in a lot of movies with different heads. That mold ends up in, in a lot of movies. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was fun. It was, it, we got the opportunity to do makeups, you know, and, and uh, contact lenses were kind of a, little bit of a new thing, especially soft lenses, and, and uh, those worked out really, really well. We had them made uh, by a guy named Larry O'Dean, and um, they worked out really well. We had lens tech, you know, put them in and all that. But yeah, it was a really cool experience because we got to work with Wes Craven, and like I said, we were huge fans of Wes Craven. I mean, Greg and I saw Nightmare on Elm Street together when we were on, working on Day of the Dead. Nightmare on Elm Street, I think, was one of the most imaginative films that I had ever seen, and that came out in 1984. We kept hearing about this movie, and at that point, there were a hundred prints only made of, of Nightmare on Elm Street that were traveling around. And by the time it came to Pittsburgh, it was chock full of edits and mess ups and missing pieces. But we went and saw it, and we got out. We're like, oh my God, that was amazing. It's like one of the coolest horror films I've ever seen. It'd be so cool to work with, you know, with these guys with Wes Craven, and then we get to meet him and work with him. He's like one of those guys, it's like very quiet tremendously intelligent and very soft-spoken. You'd never believe that all that crazy stuff is in his brain. It's like, like all those film directors of the 70s, you know, John Landis and John Carpenter and George Romero, they're all kind of like crazy, quiet geniuses. Uh, and then all this stuff comes out of their heads and you would, you'd never sit at a restaurant and go, Night Living Dead, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Last House on the Left, Hills Have Eyes, you'd never, you'd never think to do that. but. Um, I, I was really, I was really captivated. Wes and I became really good friends right out of the gate. Well, we were all big fans of Wes, you know. And my, my impressions of Wes when I met him was, you know, he's a very educated guy. He always throws, like, um, something in reality into his movies, you know, and he twists it. And what's great about Wes is he, you know, he, he you do designs and whatever for him, you know, and, you know, he picks and chooses, whatever. But um, he's very... Um, he knows what he wants when he sees it, so, you know, you go through that process with him, like any director, and, and uh, you do 100 sketches or whatever, or test makeups and stuff like that, and then he zeroes in on what he wants. And then Wes Craven is, is he's almost like a, he's like a gentleman, you know, Wes is just very, very studious to some degree. He has a wicked sense of humor, I mean, he's very sarcastic and, and very dry sense of humor, uh, uh, but he, he's amazingly articulate. He, uh, 
he knows what he likes, he knows what he wants, um, and uh, uh, it's just a very different way of working, you know? And uh, even when we're, we're shooting a film and it's in between takes, Wes always is busy doing something, you know, either working on the film or even a crossword puzzle. I remember crosswords, I, I want to say it was on the first Scream, were very popular, and Wes would hand out crossword puzzles to everybody, and we'd be on set doing crossword puzzles all the time in between setups, long setups or whatever. But Wes's mind is always working, always thinking, always thinking about this and that and how to make it better. He just has a fantastic sensibility about him, and he's really smart. He's a really smart director, and just because of, of how intellectual he is, he comes to horror from a different way. You know, when we saw the movie, the finished film, there's some really great stuff in it, you know. I think the big question we all had is, at the end, when all the people under the stairs get out and run around. So where did, we weren't sure where they went. And we had these fantasies like, okay, this one went, got a job at the supermarket, but yet his, you know, his tongue's cut out, he's got big giant black eyes and looks pretty messed up, you know. Like, where did the people under the stairs go after this film? That was our big question. Oh, I loved the movie. I thought it was great. It's, it was strange because when we were shooting it, the script was, like I said, the script was kind of one type of movie and then it sort of takes off into the stratosphere. Uh, I, I remember not really under, not really knowing what to expect from the movie, but then when it came out, I, I was really pleasantly surprised. It just had this kind of weird, quirky sense of humor and it was scary and funny. I mean, it was really a perfect movie for Wes. And it was it's a fun movie to watch because it's really entertaining in sort of a dark, yeah. twisted, perverse kind of way. That's the movie Wes set out to make. It was our first project with Wes, um, and of course, it, after that, we worked with him for years after on various projects, Vampire in Brooklyn, New Nightmare, and there's more in there. There's, uh, what, uh, Cursed, uh, various others. So, um, obviously, we, we had a relationship with Wes and his team um, that was, uh, once we had started working with him, you know, it, it just synergized, and we ended up doing multiple projects with him, so. Uh, and then eventually he ended up exec producing Wishmaster for me. It's great to see that, you know, the, the filmmakers that we grew up loving, unfortunately a lot of them don't do much anymore, but Wes seems to still kind of be out there and, you know, interested in the genre and, and, and making things, uh, you know, still making cool films and, or TV or what have you, you know, and, and uh, it'd be nice to work with Wes again, you know, it's, it's been a long time, but uh, it'd be a nice reunion and kind of uh, rekindle that relationship and we'll see what happens. Anytime you work with a director that you admire and then you have the opportunity to work with them over and over again, it just sort of reinvigorates why you got into the business to begin with. I've been very fortunate with the directors that I've worked with because a lot of them, like George Romero and like John Carpenter and John Landis and Wes, um, they're directors that I admired when I was younger. And so to be able to work with them in a capacity that allows you to put your creative ideas on the table next to theirs, I mean, you can't beat that.